Hi, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are just having our final guests arriving for the event, and we'll start at 4.30 sharp. Thank you for joining us very timely today. We'll be back at 4.30.
Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for uh, being a part of what I hope will be an amazing discussion this afternoon. We do a lot of these at SG Innovate. We have uh, two or three of these deep tech community events a week, each and every week. But this one I've been looking forward to for a while, partly because I'm very interested intellectually in this topic, this concept of what is the role of artificial intelligence in the future of health. And so I think it's an amazing opportunity for us today to explore that together. And thank you, because many of you represent different parts of the ecosystem. We have academics, we have entrepreneurs, we have people interested in investing, we have corporates. And for me personally, it's a great honor, and I hope my uh, ambassadorial and high commissioner friends will forgive me for not having the formalities of each being very formally introduced. So what I will do is, uh, with your forgiveness and permission, I'll say, Excellencies, uh, it's very nice of you to be here. And I think it's an amazing opportunity for us to have four uh, ambassadors, uh, ambassadors and high commissioners represented today. And of course, the pressure is even greater on me personally because one of my board members is here as well. So I'm very excited to have this opportunity to, to share with you. I think this concept of is AI inevitable? Do we embrace it? Do we fear it? We know that it's something that we have to confront because the imperfect allocation of medical resources and an aging population mean that we have to continue to think about new things. I hope that we will be able to explore this concept that AI is made better when it's used, that AI requires good data, but somehow this intersection of more data and the privacy of each individual seems to be a tension that we have to continuously confront, and I hope we can. Uh, we've traded data for convenience, but somehow when it comes to healthcare, everybody has a quite different view. I think we can explore that. And so like everything at SG Innovate, we don't seek to get to a perspective of this is right and this is not right. It's simply the quality of the discussion, the quality of the debate, it's the quality of the thinking that we seek to put uh, momentum to, not so much to get to a, this is the way that we would like you to think, but we would like you to simply be engaged. So what I'm going to do is, before we get kicked off, and uh, in which case I'll invite uh, Professor Tan Chor Chuan to give his opening remarks, but what I will do first, in the great tradition of SG Innovate, is to ask us to take a you were here and you were a part of it moment for us, and so I'm gonna invite my teammate to take the picture. For those that have been here, you know how the drill goes. We're all gonna jump up. We're gonna do some sort of, I'm happy to be here, which I hope you are. And we will then share this on social media along with two or three of the learning points that we tease out. So what I'm gonna do is invite uh, my friend Tuan and please everybody, if you could jump up and we'll take a picture. Yeah, and it's always good, right? When you've been seated for a while and then you have a chance to stand up and then you can be re-engaged with your full energy, full effort and full commitment. So we have people up on the mezza floor. We have people standing uh, along the corridors and people trying to get in on the steps. So they're here to be a part of this discussion. So please, uh, let's get things kicked off by welcoming Professor Tan Chor Chuan. Professor. Uh, uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Steve, for inviting me. This is my first time here, and uh, it's a great event. Uh, I don't feel that much pressure, really, Steve, although you keep telling me that we are very glad to have four excellencies here with us. Uh, I see many real experts in AI uh, and in healthcare in the audience, so please let us consider this more a dialogue, uh, because I'm not sure I'll be able to tell you anything that you don't already know. I thought I'll uh, start by saying, of course, when we think about AI, uh, we often start with uh, this sort of a news, uh, typically some AI system beating some human at some task, right? In this case, I just picked this off the net. It's uh, AI system 
beating radiologists at predicting cancer risks from x-rays. And indeed, uh, you know, there are many applications where AI could potentially help uh, to change uh, the delivery of healthcare very substantially. And last year, I had to give a talk on this topic, and I decided to try and classify it in terms of three AI angels, right? Because, uh, you know, those of us who are involved in the healthcare system knows how, know how difficult it is. Some of my friends say it takes miracles to get things done, so if you need miracles, maybe some angels would help. So the first angel is admin angel. Uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, inefficiencies in the administration of healthcare. And uh, you could imagine situations where AI could help uh, ease the administrative burden in the, in, uh, the healthcare system. Then there's the insights angels, uh, uh, which uh, really pull together information in ways that enhances the abilities of doctors and care teams to do their job better. And then there's something I would call the keeping well angel, about empowering individuals and populations to stay healthy. And for those who have chronic conditions particularly, to help them stay well, manage their health conditions better. So there are no doubt uh, many areas where AI can actually uh, help provide transformative impact in the healthcare system. So if we look at Insights Angel, for example, uh, it could do things like increase diagnostic accuracy and the example most commonly read about is imaging. And it can also provide clini clinical decision support, uh, essentially helping to deal with the huge amounts of uh, data which is being generated today to help extract uh, insights from these data and uh, present it in ways that care teams can use to uh, act more effectively and efficiently. So uh, medical imaging is the area where most of this activity is going on. If you can see this chart, you won't be able to read the legend. But the big blue segment is really uh, the amount of work being done in uh, diagnostic imaging. And in fact, uh, diagnostic imaging is a place where a lot of this is being done because there are huge amounts of uh, data which are more readily annotated and uh, where it is more amenable to machine learning. And these types of uh, medical imaging tools are uh, anticipated to be able to change substantially the workflows in uh, radiology. And most people think that it would not be a case of uh, AI replacing humans, but uh, humans and AI working together in order to deliver better outcomes. Uh, in Singapore, some of you may know that uh, we've also uh, launched um, through AI.SG, which is a National Research Foundation funded program, a grand challenge in health. And uh, the challenge uh, there, which has been posted last year to the research and clinical community, was to uh, develop, test, and to validate AI solutions that can significantly reduce the onset and progression of complications in patients with diabetes, high blood pressure, and high lipids. And, uh, so how would this, might this be done? Three teams have uh, been selected and they have started their work already. Uh, they could use AI to identify patient groups who are at higher risk so that more targeted uh, interventions could be focused on them. They could uh, help provide clinical decision support for clinical teams. Uh, some of them are looking at how to empower patients to do self-management. You know that if you have a disease like diabetes, you have to make many lifestyle changes and modifications. How can this be done better? And then uh, some of them are focusing on how you can help individuals sustain health behavior change, which is uh, very difficult. So AI.SG's uh, uh, program has started, and uh, over the next three or four years, we hope that they will yield results which would be applicable in a wider healthcare system. So I think all this are things which I, I'm sure you're familiar with. I thought I'll, I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, this particular issue, which I, I think is particularly important, which is how do we take this very promising technology and actually deploy it at scale, right? So it's how do you move from pilots, promising applications to deployment at some scale? And I think there are many factors that obviously 
need to be considered. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, focus on three of them. The, the first is really trust and buy-in. Uh, because uh, these are new technologies, we are dealing with individuals with health problems. The medical uh, system is one which is conservative. And so we need really the trust of patients and the public, and we need the buy-in of health professionals in order for this to be deployed at scale. I uh, was not able really to find a lot of data on the issue of public trust, uh, but in 2018, uh, this uh, private company did a survey of about 800 patients from Europe and the US uh, in three of these areas and asked them a whole bunch of questions the application of AI in their care. And I just summarize a few highlights here. So the first, which is reassuring for physicians like me and some of those of you in the room, uh, the patients do not want doctors to be replaced by AI. Uh, they prefer AI to be helping their human physicians. So this is reassuring for all of you who have kids in medical school. Now, they actually quite welcome virtual nurses uh, because they can get 24-7 uh, uh, types of uh, responses to inquiries, and if asked about AI in general, not just in health, what people worry about are job losses, but cybersecurity and data privacy are very important considerations. So we need to take this into account because the, in the long term, the deployment of AI at scale would depend on us uh, being able to maintain and grow that trust that uh, the effect of AI will be in the, for the good of individuals, for the good of populations, and for the good of society at large. Now, on the physician side, um, you know, it's not very reassuring when we have very uh, important figures in machine learning say things like, they should stop training radiologists now. This was a, a, a often quoted uh, comment made in 2011, right? Uh, I think a more kind of a balanced uh, view that's emerging uh, are, uh, are sort of considerations like um, medical professionals, in this case radiologists, because a lot of the work is focused on imaging, uh, must plan for a future in which AI becomes part of your work colleagues. You know? So instead of having Jim, Joe, you have an AI uh, algorithm called Jane or something, right? Uh, you have got to see them as part of the healthcare workforce. And we need to also understand uh, that this move fast and break things kind of culture uh, is not going to work in healthcare, which is evidence-based and more move slowly and don't hurt anybody. So you need to uh, understand that uh, you can't just come in and disrupt healthcare as it has done in uh, other areas such as e-commerce. So how do we make sure uh, that we are able to secure the buy-in of health professionals in the deployment of AI? I think there are many considerations, but clearly we need to uh, ensure the validity of the AI's recommendations when it applies to individuals. And uh, this is usually compared with a whole series of human experts. Equally important, uh, we need to understand how did the AI algorithm come up with a particular recommendation? That's part of explainability. Because being able to explain the basis by which the AI algorithms produce recommendations then allows um, uh, physicians to have better confidence in the recommendation. It allows us to uh, collaborate with our patients in decision making. It uh, helps to reduce bias, both by the AI algorithm and the individual, and it also addresses, in part, some of the medical liability issues that could arise. Because uh, if you have to explain how an eventually uh, de a decision was made clinically, uh, it would help a great deal if the AI application was explainable. And another very important consideration is that um, when we actually deploy learning, machine learning models in a clinical arena, we really need to test to see what is the effect of the human-machine interaction in real-life clinical situations. Because uh, you have a smart algorithm, but it needs to be inserted 
into the workflow and interact with the clinical team in a way that allows uh, the, uh, the machine learning designers to understand how the doctors are interpreting the outputs of the recommendations. So it's not just a simple matter of putting an algorithm there, generating a whole bunch of outputs, and then expecting the clinical teams to uh, use them. And one sort of aspect of this is, of course, we want to try to avoid dumbing down, right? I came here, I'd use my Google Maps. Uh, so I feel so insecure nowadays, if I don't use Google Maps, I feel kind of a loss, right? Uh, I'm sort of getting dumbing down, dumbing down, right? Uh, so you really want to try to avoid that kind of effect. In the best ways in which you set up a clinical workflow, the machine learns from the human, but the human should actually learn from the machine so that the whole team continually improves. You don't want a situation where the machine is learning and the human is actually going down in their skill levels, right? So how to set this up requires quite a bit of thought when you uh, deploy the systems. So that's the first point about buy-in and trust. The, the second point is a more general one, which is uh, uh, piloting is easy, scaling is difficult in the healthcare system. And the question is, why is scaling so difficult in the healthcare system? And part of the reason is because in order to scale, you have to address at least five things more or less around the same time, right? So first, you have got to have a, a change in the care process, the redesign, its implementation, and this is usually led by professionals. Clearly, you have to engage patients, they have to trust what you're doing is in their good. There's a change management process. Then this change management process has to be supported with data, with technology, including AI. And uh, it's got to be worked into the process by which clinical care redesign is happening. And then finally, quite often, in order to sustain and to scale, you need to address the financing of this. You look at, you look at the incentives for the patient, for the provider and for the payer, right? So you need to do all these more or less at the same time. And if you just came in with a technology but didn't really look at care redesign or eventually financing, then it's much harder really for your technology to be wide, more widely adopted and to scale. So this is just a, a, a very complicated slide, but actually is making a, a simple point about Workflows, right? So this is taken from a white paper from the Canadian Association of Radiologists published in 2018. And it kind of maps out how would AI work in a clinical workflow, right? So this is the normal situation. The test is done. The radiologist reads it, says normal, abnormal, right? Uh, the AI uh, system could be used in different ways. It could uh, do a triage, means that when you do the test, the AI looks at it and then says what is normal, what is abnormal, and the abnormal ones are looked at by the radiologist. So that's triaging, right? Or it could be the other way around. It could be the radiologist who looks at it and the AI does some specialized tasks to confirm a diagnosis. Or it could be replaced. That means uh, no human in the loop. AI says yes or no. Now, uh, this part, um, most people would say uh, we stay away from for the moment because there are many ethical, legal, and liability issues if you just have a uh, AI algorithm without the man, right? So, but the, the point being made here is that um, the, the way in which the AI uh, algorithms are being used have to be worked in uh, systematically into the way in which the whole clinical workflow is being redesigned. And uh, Related to this is um, the fact that uh, you can have uh, very nice um, design uh, pathways, you can have AI, but if you are dealing with human behavior, uh, these are things which uh, go beyond just the technologies. And just, just to remind us uh, that this is important, uh, this was a study done by a colleague in Duke and US, published in 2016, looking at uh, fitness trackers on health behaviors and using financial incentives to increase phys physical activity. And you can see uh, in a trial of 800 participants, uh, it was effective. It increased people's activity. 
after six months, uh, when the trial finished, only 40% of people, uh, 40% of people stopped uh, their health tracking behaviors. And one year later, only 10% were still wearing the trackers. I think the rest of them had either given them away or put them away in the cupboards, right? So this just to remind us that um, the technology is important, but uh, the key really is human behavior. And the final point I'll just make, uh, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to talk more about this, so I would just uh, not spend a lot of time on this, uh, is data issues. And uh, the two really critical ones are data quality. And I took this from uh, a paper written by one of my colleagues, uh, which was published in Lancet this year. Uh, healthcare data are notorious. I thought he chose the words well. For being voluminous, lots of it, messy, especially doctor's handwriting, and complex. And for these data to become useful, they have to be mapped, pre-processed, before they can be used to train machine learning methods. And uh, so this is a very important point, which uh, if you like, we could talk more about later. And then, of course, as Steve mentioned, data privacy and security are absolutely critical. So with, with that as a sort of a thumbnail uh, survey of the territory, I'd like to just stop by saying that uh, there are many issues that are really critical to address if you want to bring the promise of AI into deployment, and uh, some of the, these things are listed here. So with that, I thank you once again, and I look forward to your comments and insights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, please, George Juan, come on back up, and Philip. So uh, I should have, I'm sure, done a better job introducing uh, Chor Chuan and, and Philip. Chor Chuan, in his capacity as chief health scientist for Singapore and really leading the charge in this very ambitious uh, statement of healthcare transformation. And of course, Philip as uh, what we call a clini clinician innovator, uh, both a practicing clinician, but also the founder of one of the, I would say, more mature medtech startups from Singapore. So we have a great perspective of both being clinicians, also from an academic perspective, also from an entrepreneurial perspective. So we're using Slido today for those that already use Slido, where we have the uh, original technology called Raise Your Hand and we'll bring you a microphone. And so I have some questions, but Importantly, this is an opportunity for any of you to engage because I can ask questions all day long and they may not be those that are on your mind. So please make sure that you're also taking the opportunity to ask your own questions. I'm going to jump in uh, while you're thinking of some of your questions. So, uh, Chor Chuan, we had Lee Kai Fu with us, who's obviously an evangelist for artificial intelligence. And Kai Fu was talking about quantity of information, but of course we assume basically that it is accurate to start. Let's assume that we don't have bad information. So the idea of more information is important. Uh, you touched on the fact that move fast and break things doesn't work in medicine. But when we think about sometimes using technology is frankly one of the only paths to improving it. Automobiles, Whenever there was an accident, somebody said, let's put in a safety belt, let's put in anti-lock brakes, let's put in airbags, which we learned through difficult lessons. Can we extrapolate a bit and take a look? Is there a path to faster iteration and innovation in medicine, even accepting that the consequences for getting it wrong are real? I think so. I, um, it's difficult because um, one of the issues here is uh, we are uh, in the healthcare system, of course, is dealing with uh, people's lives and diseases. And therefore, I think appropriately, we have to ensure that uh, the things that we do uh, keep that top uppermost in our minds. Because in the end, we're trying to deliver benefits to individuals. Having said that, I think there's a lot of scope for research, and we have to be clear about research, how it's applied. Uh, there are sandboxes in which and validate some of these concepts, but when it comes out to actual application in uh, real, real life patients, like everything else, uh, whether it's a device, a drug, or a new uh, clinical approach, 
uh, we need really the evidence uh, of efficacy and safety. So can, how can we uh, speed uh, things up? I think uh, really um, having much better quality uh, data sources uh, would be a really important thing. And having said that, I want to underscore this is easy to say, it's hard to do. Uh, what everybody is really looking for is uh, uh, data which is um, crosses several domains, right? So uh, the ideal kind of data that uh, we like to... Uh, The ideal, ideal uh, set of things uh, would be if you're able to combine clinical data with behavioral data, with uh, genetic data in a de-identified and secure manner, and uh, draw insights which are relevant to patients. So, so that's uh, really very important. But um, it's not a trivial task to prepare data to uh, a form that uh, is really suitable for machine learning. And I. Uh, it might take me a couple of minutes to explain this, but I don't know whether you you want me to do that or or whether you, know, you want to focus on other aspects. Well, let's, yeah. come, let's come back to the practical side. Uh, yes, please explain because we're all here to listen and learn. I think one of the realities is to get the right quantity of image, for example, the annotation and the quality of the annotation. So one argument is, Country X may have a lot of information, but the annotation is less quality than country Z, which has less data but better annotated, which is better to build AI. We would, we would think of better annotation. But I think some of the questions that are coming in, and I want to come back to the point that you've raised, what would be a practical, executable, let's get going with it use case in which we're not trying to go so far out on the edge that risk has to be a very serious factor. How can we, to use the expression, crawl and walk and run? Some of the questions coming in from Slido already are including things such as how can we use, where can we use, when can we use? Are there things that you've been thinking about where the data is the right data, the risk tolerance is the right level? Uh, so I think that's the reason why imaging is really the, the one that is most focused on now because uh, there's a, a great deal of data. It's amenable uh, to annotation and labeling in ways that uh, make it easier to learn. And uh, then there's also a possibility of uh, checking against uh, experts um, and, in, and being used as clinic, clinician, clinical decision support. So how do we actually uh, uh, do this? Um, maybe I'll, it might be best for me to illustrate with an example. An example I want to use is um, the um, use of AI uh, to screen um, retinal photographs of patients with diabetes. So as you all know, uh, patients with diabetes uh, would go for a retinal uh, examination every year. Typically, uh, there's a retinal ph photograph, and it used to be looked at by doctors in polyclinics, in eye centers, and so on. Uh, about uh, four or five years ago, um, the, uh, some uh, faculty from NUS worked with uh, those from the eye center to develop an AI algorithm that uh, would uh, spot abnormalities. Um, and they, uh, they created training sets uh, in which they then used to train the, the AI uh, algorithms. Then in terms of deployment, uh, it was first deployed in a polyclinic uh, where it was used in parallel with uh, human readers. And right now, it's uh, now going to the national reading centers for retinal photographs, where it's again being used in parallel. So, so images are generated, uh, they go to two sets of human readers on one arm and they go through the AI machine on the other arm and then the results are being compared. And eventually, the, the mode of deployment, which is contemplated, is that uh, there are two sets of human readers normally. One screens and then one confirms. And uh, the, the thinking is that the AI algorithm will then replace the first set of human readers. So to do that, um, the AI algorithm is set to be sensitive, not to miss possible cases. So it's not. So it's not meant to uh, be uh, specific that pick up cases definitively. It's meant to be sensitive because its role in the clinical workflow is to screen 
for possible abnormalities. So it screens for things and it generates a certain number of false positives, but then it reduces the workload uh, for the second set of human readers by about 40 to 50 percent. And uh, so we can have now uh, human readers who are more experienced, uh, for whom uh, the load has been reduced by about half. So that's kind of how uh, it occurs, and I can imagine this being played out in different types of situations dealing with images, right? When you come to more complex types of clinical decision support, as uh, I described the example of uh, AI.SG, uh, that's where we really want to learn uh, from uh, that experience, how we might apply similar approaches uh, to situations which don't involve images. And um, it, were, it, it requires us to uh, identify data sets, to uh, clean data sets, that will then allow training of the uh, AI algorithms, and then to understand how these could be uh, nicely inserted into the workflow so that they can really support and uh, improve the efficiency and effectiveness of uh, the application. So this is something we're going to learn over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, but I, I think it's really important because it goes beyond images, beyond machine learning to natural language processing and so on, which is actually much more uh, complex and difficult to do. And, and a fuller definition of AI, right? If we only focus on the image detection, that wouldn't be a fuller definition. Uh, Philip, for those that may not know the team that you've built with Web Biotech and Spider and so on, I, I hope everybody does, but do you want to take just a moment to share and then I'm going to jump in on some questions for you, please. Okay, I, I'm going to share a little bit more uh, about AI in healthcare. I think that is very good. And uh, I think as I get older, I want to make more complex things uh, simple. So we want to go by simple definitions. So let's start again from the very beginning, what AI actually is. AI by, defini by definition means machine learning. It means the machine is learning something to give you something else, okay? As opposed to an algorithm. An algorithm is very simple. So you learn in maths, right? One plus one equals two. But by definition, AI means that, you know, in cases where one plus one is not equals to two, it has to pick up that and explain to you why one plus one is not equal to two. So machine learning or AI is not such a simple thing to quantify and quantitate in medical care. And the reason is this. As doctors, you know, we have other things we are learning to help patients, which is the main outcome. So compassion, empathy, care, these type of words are, you know, you can't tell a computer to care for a person more than another person, for example. But in the case of uh, healthcare, you know, we have other conditions, uh, social background and so on, where this, these, these uh, things are taken into account before you can make a clinical decision to help the patient. So there is, a, there is, a, there is a difficulty, I think, for most people to understand uh, when they put a process or solution uh, into the care, healthcare uh, facility, what AI is actually doing in that system. So I think it's very important as Prof mentioned, to really put a definition to what that AI process is doing to the whole solution. Now, in radiology, this is actually quite simple. If you think of it, radiology, or in case of your photograph for the eye, these are what we call snapshot information, and typically from one source. So either from a CT scanner, X-ray machine, or in this case, an eye scanner that looks at the eye photographs, right? So the information coming into the AI is fixed, right? There's no variable to that information. It's black and white, it's in dots, or as Prof put it up, it's very well mapped out. So in this case, I think this is where the effect of AI has the best benefit. So AI has applications because it can scale very quickly if you have that massive load of accurate data coming in. But again, it's very hard for us to judge, okay? What is accurate data? So this typically has to go through a medical uh, regulatory authority. So they can say, you know, the data is coming from a class two device. This is accurate. The sensitivity is beyond 90 to 95%. Therefore, we can use that data, okay? So I think there's a, there's a sort of a time scale to where AI can come into healthcare. And perhaps these are some of the points that we should think about uh, from the very ground level on uh, whether AI will become a big thing of the future. So we've talked about image detection. You've got a device which allows remote monitoring 
of, of patients' uh, cardiology. Help us understand, so in this sort of flowing data, which would be 24 hours a day, seven days a week, help us understand how you see AI playing a meaningful role. You'll be generating huge amounts of data based on how many people and how much monitoring over how many hours in how many situations and conditions. So there's a lot of context different than sort of the snapshot that you described. But help us understand how you see something like the device that you've been uh, the inventor of fitting with AI. Okay, so the, the heart is a lot more uh, complicated uh, organ because it beats, right, every day. So if you know your heart beats about 80,000 times a day, a day, just in a single day. So if I record an ECG for a day, I'm taking 80,000 data points. It's unlike where I take an x-ray, I have one data point, the chest x-ray basically. So it's a lot more complex in the sense because we are getting not snapshot data, but continuous data, right? So it brings me to the point of why we started this company. We started this company not because of AI and not because of the promise of AI, but because we wanted to address some of the early pain points uh, in the healthcare system. So two pain points we were really trying to address when we started the company was accessibility and connectivity. So a lot of the problems that doctors face is because we don't have access to patients' data, right? So the EHR gives us a lot of data, but you imagine as a doctor, I see a patient, I have five to 10 minutes for the consult. I don't get any of his data that he has previously had for the last 30 years or 50 years. I have to look for this and it takes a long time, right? So the accessibility to data is an issue we are trying to address. With digital care, it's not AI particularly, but with digital health, what we can do is we can front load data for physicians to look at the data and to analyze the data. So the spider was trying to address this because it's a wireless device, a digital device. We can collect data even before the patient comes to the hospital or we front load the data. Now the other thing we were trying to address is of course trying to put all the data into a very comfortable uh, pocket of information that a physician can look at at a glance, right, and analyze the data and make a clinical decision, a proper clinical decision. Now, this data uh, scrubbing, data analysis, and so on, is probably where AI can be the most effective eventually. So we have now algorithms on our system that can tell you one plus one is two, or in our speak, uh, ECG has a normal rhythm, for example, and can exclude that from scrubbing. And in the future, obviously, we hope that if AI comes into place, the data can be made more meaningful uh, by speeding up the scrubbing process, which is a lot of it is done manually. And this is where I think uh, the AI promise uh, will be there in the future. So the cool thing is you are perhaps without intending at that beginning of the journey, you are now gathering huge amounts of what could be very interesting predictive uh, insights in addition to sort of the monitoring and, and so on. Now, I'm, I'm getting too many upvotes to ignore the question for long. Uh, one of the, I always like to sort of bounce around, but one of the questions is, what specifically is Singapore doing to open health data from the public sector to allow researchers and entrepreneurs to try and pursue innovations? This is a question that I also ask a great deal because uh, I, I also come from a research background and I would say that uh, we are really working on it. Um, the, the balance here that we're trying to strike is um, maintaining uh, the long-term trust uh, of uh, the public um, because we are in this for long haul and um, breaches um, missteps uh, undermine that trust and would take us back a long way. Um, so we uh, need to uh, do so. I think within the Ministry of Health, there are several streams of work really right now that are uh, just getting the data organized in ways that uh, make them uh, more interoperable to allow them to uh, be uh, analyzed uh, by different groups initially within the ministry. And then I think we would also need to set up the mechanisms by which that data, the identified forms, can be more uh, readily shared with uh, researchers from who are not involved in the patient, the care delivery journey. So I would say uh, I'm, I'm aware of the issues. Uh, um, 
also coming from a research background, uh, we would uh, be focusing, I think, initially on um, looking at uh, bringing together the data that actually could contribute to uh, improvement in healthcare. So like AI.SG and so on, I mean, there is the, the potential for a, a clinical payback and then uh, setting in place infrastructure, the governance, uh, the rules uh, to allow safe um, data sharing. All right. One of the one of the questions that I have, and maybe it's controversial, but I'm going to ask it nonetheless, which is, if I think of any government, this isn't about Singapore per se, any government's ability to exercise eminent domain, as in confiscate private property for public good, assuming there's some reasonable compensation. But the example would be land in order to have a railway go through in order to reach somewhere, that's considered a public good. Is there a future in which you see government's need, again, any government's need, to improve healthcare because of an increasing aging population, an increasing chronic condition load, and therefore not so much opt-in permission, but asserting that we need this data and we will, quote, use this data. And now the issue is one of privacy and anonymity, but not based on consent. Uh, I'm just interested in this intersection of how do we dramatically increase the amount of data with which people can be working to try and tackle these harder problems? I think if uh, it is, uh, say, within a, a health delivery mode where we are actually uh, bringing together data in order to save, uh, to serve patients better. Uh, that's already occurring in all health systems. We, we do analytics, uh, we uh, improve operations, uh, we use data uh, for, from the patients in order to improve the delivery to them. I, I think, of course, we need to exercise uh, high standards of security, confidentiality, and so on, but I think that would be acceptable to, to most individuals because it is really in their own interests as well uh, as to the interests of those who are uh, using the healthcare system. Uh, I think on the other extreme, uh, if you are looking at using data for for-profit purposes, I think that is uh, something which is a little bit different um, because uh, here, here the, the, the benefits could accrue to individuals and the public but it, there's also a for-profit motive. And I think there we really have to be really careful about being able to strike the right balance. Um, also, uh, there is this concern about uh, even if you use de-identified data, anonymized data, if enough of the data is out there, can it really be really de-identified? I think we have to uh, examine this further to see really what, is the, uh, what are the ways in which we can preserve uh, real uh, anonymity of the data once we put it out there. And uh, I, I think right now we don't really have, in my view, the, the, the most ideal solutions. So, so we need to kind of strike that balance because as I said, um, we are really into this for the long term. And if you think back on other innovations, cloning, uh, genetic engineering, uh, genetically modified foods. Uh, they, they provide examples of where, uh, when you try to rush this process, you could actually set the whole uh, field back, uh, in, in some cases, by years or decades. Um, so, so I think carrying, uh, being really sensitive to this and uh, being engaging the public uh, on this so that there's a proper balance of uh, perceived benefits and uh, limitation of risks, I think, is really important. Let me go out. I've got other questions, but I want to make sure that I keep the promise. Are there questions that anybody in the audience has that you'd like to ask of the two leaders, please? Jean Luc? Yeah. Uh, Mike? Here. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Philip. The implication for AI and the bigger problem of rising cost of healthcare, um, do you see a time where we will have a funding mechanism backed up by data out of AI, machine learning, 
where we will indeed be able to change patients' behavior. Because as long as, as you know, as long as the patient's behavior doesn't change and there's no incentive, yeah. even though here in Singapore we are providing some incentives, but if there are no incentives for that, then nothing really changes. So that's an important question, uh, which is really about, um, in a sense, value-based healthcare, uh, if I understand your question correctly. So how could the application of AI improve outcomes while reducing costs? How can it allow us to do a better job? I, I think there could be some potential ways. The first is we uh, all put a, a great deal of uh, emphasis on prevention, but the heart of prevention um, of behavioral lifestyles which uh, contribute to more than 40% of uh, the um, excess mortality is really sustained behavior change. And uh, so some of the things that are uh, being investigated is the use of AI and the engagement methods to uh, help individuals sustain positive health behavior changes that would then lead to prevention of diseases more effectively and uh, reductions in the burden of chronic disease. So that could be one really important area where uh, AI and other technologies could help. The second area could be really in better targeting um, to segment patients more appropriately. And um, uh, if we have 100,000 diabetic patients and we manage them all in the same way, uh, it, there could be quite a number of patients who could be managed maybe more simply, more self-management, and there are some who actually need much more intensive management. And so the ability for us to segment patients much more uh, precisely and then to be able to tailor the amount of healthcare delivery uh, which is appropriate for these individuals would then allow us uh, potentially to be more productive and be able to be more effective in uh, distributing resources. So th this uh, and other ways uh, might be the ways in which we could really intervene uh, using AI uh, at a population health level to try to improve the effectiveness of um, uh, health outcomes while uh, managing costs and uh, also the demands on the professional manpower. Hey, Philip, I, I always love asking the idea about personal medicine and so on. So do you see as a Clinician, do you see a future in which N equals one? You know, we, everybody has medicine for them based on, let's call it genomic sequencing, based on epigenetics. Is there a future of N equals one? Or do we basically strive for sort of stratification, which is you're, you're not like everybody else, but you're like these other 10,000 people. What's your vision of the future of medicine? And therefore, by extension, how would AI play a role in providing that to you? Uh, that's a very loaded question there. So, but I think uh, there are two, if you look at it in two ways, and I see that in myself as well, you know, as I age and I enter into a system where I'm looking at someone to look after me and so on, but then decide that, you know, probably the, the system cannot look after me, I have to look after myself. So I think the motivation and the challenges are really uh, changing, but maybe a point first about what is uh, population data and what is individual or personal data. So population data is something that we take as a whole, can be easily anonymized and can be shared. This is the big data that you look at. For example, you want to look at the incidence of atrial FIP in a population of 65, you can quickly do that and find out. And perhaps then it focuses you on that population uh, age where you can go in and do a lot more preventive programs to prevent the patient from getting stroke, for example. Now, in terms of the individual, this is really the challenge because you can see the motivation, as in Prof pointed out, after you know, a period of a year, everybody gives up and doesn't want to look after their own activity and so on. But I think that there is something uh, that we can learn here from the gamers. So I, I keep asking myself, my son is 12 years old and he's uh, going to do his PSLE, but he's very addicted to this game. Uh, and he keeps wanting to play it and not think about his homework and so on. So I, I'm wondering what is the addiction for him to play a game, right, to keep him going. So the addiction is to become better, right? So he wants to become better at a game, have better outcomes. So we can apply that same thinking uh, to the individual. I think that will help the individual have his own journey towards having better health outcomes. Now, the other important thing about healthcare costs, right, 
healthcare costs start to rise tremendously the first, the, as soon as you step into a hospital. Now, everything outside the hospital is much less expensive. So if you go in the hospital, for example, you see a consultant, it's $150 to see a consultant, right? But you see a GP or you go to the polyclinic, it's one-tenth the price to see a GP or a polyclinic doctor. So costs are very expensive when you go into a hospital setting. So any data that helps you to improve yourself or prevent yourself from getting into a hospital, I, going, I think is going to be a very important motivation uh, for that person, okay, to use whatever tool that person is going to use. Now, the thing is, as a physician, what I face is, of course, I don't know the individual's life health journey. And I think this is going to be very important for how AI is going to play a part in personal medicine. So the problem is why we don't know the individual's health journey is because you don't collect any of your health data outside the hospital. When we have all these, you know, new wearables that can collect all these data outside, and if you can collect that data and form it into a, what we call a retrospective database to give you an a, a individual's data, uh, bio data, or in our case, we call it a personal health record, right? That will be extremely useful for us doctors and for AI to help you package everything into a nicer bio profile to improve your healthcare. So if you can do all these things, uh, get the bio data, uh, get AI to work on this, so that it can help you communicate your issues or create insight to yourself as well as to the doctor looking after you. I think this will be very important in terms of the individual's uh, data planning uh, in the future. So let me just ask a, a social question, and I haven't discussed it with my panelists and I haven't thought about it too much, so let me just freestyle for a moment. In the same way that a vehicle has many, many dozens, depending on the vehicle, more than dozens of sensors that talk to you about every aspect of the vehicle in order to keep it operating well. If I could paint a picture, so just follow for a moment, if I could paint a picture in which you have a variety of on you or in you sensors, and I have a genomic sequence, I have an ongoing monitoring of what I ate this morning did what to me in terms of blood sugar. Yes, there's already things like patches, and you can think of this. But if we could dashboard you, and the idea is instead of saying six months from now, you know, please exercise more or less, the answer is I, I simply get an alert that says, hey, have a bit more, you know, protein at dinner and a bit less whatever. Is this something that would be considered exciting? Amazing in terms of giving you minor course corrections versus these sort of big, you know, change your lifestyle. I personally am biased in favor of give me more so that I can make more informed decisions. But I know in some of these settings, people say, hey, no, no news is good news. So if we could have the fully dashboarded human so that when I go see Philip next time, he's got every single thing that I've been thinking about to give me the best care possible. How many people would be interested in that capability, as in the fully dashboarded human? Uh, so 15%? I, 20%? Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I, I call that a digital persona, right? So it's like an avatar, your health avatar, right? So for a physician to be able to see everything in a summary is much easier for us. So if you have that all in a summary, your genetic data, vital signs, outcome data, your management of diabetes over the last uh, five months or six months, I think it makes a physician's decision, key decisions much uh, accurate, more accurate and much more effective. I, I just also have a, a, a slightly different perspective. And so first, I, I think uh, for those of us who like to be fully dashboarded and if there are technologies that can do that, then I think it's great because uh, the, the more you can self-manage, uh, the more you can understand uh, and uh, do better, that, that's great. But it's very also very important at a population health level that we are as ex inclusive as we can be. Because uh, if you look at a population level, quite often it's maybe 15, 20% of uh, individuals that end up with uh, many of the medical issues that uh, need to go to hospitals, they end up uh, consuming a lot of healthcare and creating costs. And um, we uh, need to ensure that uh, as we roll out new ways of doing things, that we don't create new types of digital, di digital divides, uh, that uh, we have to think about 
how best we can deploy technologies in ways then, that actually can help uh, the, the greatest number of individuals. And this might not be possible, and uh, so you could take a system level view uh, of this in, uh, say hypothetically, you could see those who are uh, able, willing, keen to, to uh, self-manage, uh, you know, we should empower them. And maybe that will re re release resources that then allow us to uh, engage the difficult to reach, uh, the, the people who are not as well educated, uh, people who are not keen on technology, and also help them to uh, then be able to improve their own health. Uh, I, I think it's really important for us to focus on this because it's not actually the average, certainly not the frontier, it's actually the lagging 15-20% of uh, individuals in, in, in most populations that actually uh, generate, uh, that carry most of the uh, disease burden and actually uh, require the most use of uh, health facilities. Okay, other questions from the audience? Yes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Ti Hui. I'm the country president of AstraZeneca, a pharmaceutical company. Um, and maybe just a follow up, Dr. Wong, to your earlier question and open up to the panelists in about both the population level data and the individual data. Who owns the data, number one? And number two is, to what extent can we share the data? And I think the context of the question is, you know, if I'm as, as an individual, Given the healthcare system in the world, if I have a cough and cold, I, I go to a GP, but if I have more chronic diseases, I may go to a hospital. You know, does the data, who owns that data? Is it the individual and who have access to the data? Uh, second point is really more upstream from a research point of view. We recently just um, joined the National Precision Medicine and we have a number of studies uh, with um, SynCloud on registries as well. And there's some specific challenges in terms of where you can store the data um, outside of Singapore and, and we're getting a little bit of roadblock on in at, at that macro level. So just comments on who owns the data and how can we share data. Thank you. So if you have a research project and uh, depending on the nature of the consent, uh, so it's consent driven, uh, based on the consent, then that provides the researchers with uh, the scope within which they can use their data. And uh, typically the researchers, uh, steward the data, but uh, those who receive public funding, actually the data then uh, goes into public databases that uh, can be shared more generally within the scope of the consent, right? Uh, for, for those who uh, attend uh, medical facilities, then uh, it's largely operating on deemed consent that uh, you know, you're, you're entering a medical facility and therefore uh, we within the health system, uh, we'll do what uh, we need to do in order to deliver safe and uh, good care to you. And uh, that requires also a fair amount of data sharing and so on. Now, uh, the uncertainty, of course, is to what extent does this extend into using that data for research, particularly if it's for for-profit for for profit, uh, types of reasons. I think that's an area really where uh, it would be easiest if it were uh, also on the basis of consented uh, permission in order to proceed on that. Uh, and I think these are some of the areas which are, I would say are, are not fully settled and uh, for which really we need uh, engagement with the general public in order to reach uh, a situation where we can strike the right balance. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Philip a question. I'm going to go to the audience for a question, and I want to make sure I leave time for us to also have networking because that's always one of the key parts of these evenings. Philip, one of the questions, and it's gotten a lot of upvotes, so I'm going to put you on the spot. It says, are there examples, or in this particular case, an example, of a successful AI medical device startup I don't know how we want to use the expression AI, so I'm going to just let's sort of, for the moment, medical device that might utilize aspects of AI, because I don't know how you'd have AI medical device. But AI enabled or AI spin down from a medical device, born in Singapore, now in multiple countries. And if you want to invoke the company you're building, please feel free. 
uh, because you're in many different countries now. So do you, do you want to share a little bit? And let me broaden the question also. Can Singapore be a builder of globally relevant, at a minimum, multi-continent relevant uh, medical technology devices? That's a lot of questions, actually. <laughs> so maybe pick, pick let me start. You feel yeah, let me start from about. the beginning. So medical device is, uh, of course, is a very commonplace. We've been using medical device for a long time, and uh, Singapore, in that respect, has built many medical device uh, companies. So one of the device companies which I think is well known is uh, Biosensors International, that makes a stent, and we use that stent very often in. Uh, clinical uh, patients. Uh, it's a class three medical device which has a high risk profile. Uh, and they've managed to develop the company over 20 years and uh, is a listed company and is doing uh, pretty well as a company. So there are multiple uh, device companies ranging from small to big and so on. Uh, the other concept is, of course, uh, AI. Now, AI in clinical practice, to be honest, it's, it's uh, is a real challenge now. So if you look at any product that is going into healthcare, there are many, many phases uh, of which can be challenging in many areas. So AI, for example, is easier to, it's easy to prove a concept, it's easy to do early development uh, and so on. But one real key barrier of any medical product is always the clinical acceptance followed by the implementation. Now these are key, right? And as Prof uh, pointed up in his, uh, a uh, slide of the five uh, sort of key hurdles, right? That, that process is actually a very big challenge. Uh, in Singapore, it's very tough, right? Uh, even though we have got very good uh, uh, ground base for uh, uh, human capital, uh, developmental uh, platforms and so on, it's tough because there is a challenge getting uh, your product into a hospital. So you, instead of having saying, uh, is there any Singapore company that has made it medically? I would ask, is there any Singapore company that has made a medical device that has got into a local institution? I can tell you, I can I can kind of name three, you know. So it, it's it's hard to be a prophet in your own country, right? So that that is a, a challenge. Maybe uh, see if I could uh, chip in here to say, maybe I ask the question in another way, which is, uh, um, what are the sort of things that could be could give you a competitive advantage um, working out of this region uh, if you wanted to uh, have a startup. I, I would say one aspect of this is differences between Asian populations and non-Asian populations. So for example, if you look at um, um, genetics, um, quite a lot of the uh, genome sequencing data uh, that's available today uh, come from Caucasian populations. So in fact, 80% of the genetic information in the public domain is Caucasian. And 20% is the rest of the world. And of that 20%, 18% are Asians, right? And um, so when you start to use this for um, algorithms and so on, representativeness is really important because if not, you're going to have training sets which are biased, in this case towards uh, Caucasian uh, genetic predispositions to disease and then you may end up with uh, incorrect assignments when you start to look at populations which are not represented in your training sets. So, so part of the work that uh, we're doing in Singapore is really to contribute to this, the, the Asian uh, genetic data sets uh, that would then help to um, provide uh, additional information that would create representativeness. The second uh, thing I, I think is um, not really the technology, but it, the way it's going to be used in clinical practice. And so one thing I would uh, suggest is uh, you know, working very closely with clinicians, the right clinicians. And I think the best people are uh, combinations where the technology people know about the clinical domain, and you're working with clinicians who know enough about the technologies and AI. And uh, my own personal experience in trying to do matchmaking has been that the, the most successful matchmakes have been when we've been able to find individuals who can bridge between the two domains, the technology and the health domain, and then you're able really to design technologies that uh, meet real clinical needs and uh, can be uh, 
adapted in a way that uh, addresses real clinical issues, right? And the final point, it's, um, it's not just um, for medical devices, as Philip will, will be able to say more, it's not really about whether it works, but whether it uh, can actually add value, uh, whether it uh, can replace workflows, become more efficient, uh, save costs. Uh, because everybody is trying to become uh, not just a device, but the standard of care, right? So the question is how to become a standard of care. Uh, it, I think uh, the clinical interface and the business uh, aspects of the device would also be really important. So the proverbial so what question. I've created this thing, invented this thing, and the answer is so what if we cannot articulate what it improves, makes better, accelerates. Uh, last question from the audience, please. Yes, please, if you don't mind. Oh, I guess we have a microphone. Hello. I'd like to know what you think about decentralized model and governance in order to foster such AI-driven solution in the healthcare space. Decentralized model of governance. Decentralized model and the use of the blockchain to foster you know, the scale of this AI-driven solution and help to share anonymized data and protect our privacy. Well, my, my colleague uh, Robert Morris is here. will be able to tell you a lot more about blockchain as a real expert. I, I, I think those are tools, uh, but the, the data sharing part of it uh, you know, clearly goes beyond that. Um, the, the more uh, privacy-preserving tools, the better platforms that we have that allow data to be shared in de-identified, private, and secure ways, the better. Uh, but then you also need the kind of overarching governance structure that uh, ensures access and safety. So to the extent that uh, blockchain or other privacy-preserving techniques uh, can uh, help automate the de-identification and safe sharing, clearly that would be a great advance, but we still do need the governance, the processes, and the ethical and legal infrastructure to be able to do this properly. So it will be an important part of the solution, but by itself, it may not be sufficient to uh, allow the kind of uh, more widespread uh, type of sharing that we discussed earlier. I think uh, even more important than that is the data that you're going to get to enter into the system. So the data, the quality of the data you get uh, from any source must be accurate enough so that your AI or your blockchain and other mechanisms can uh, get to it and work on it effectively. Remember, garbage in, garbage out. So it's very critical that uh, the sensors that you e use or the input of the data that you put in be effective enough or be of high quality enough so that the data can be of use. Okay, so in the interest of time, because I always want to make sure that we have a chance to speak with each other and, and chat also in smaller groups. So here's some takeaways from me, which is always work at this intersection of domain and technology. So the partners, and there are some really amazing clinician innovators. As much as Philip's amazing, he'll join me in saying, and there are other amazing clinician innovators in Singapore. So finding those champions and, and working, especially for the technologists in the room. Second is it sounds like if we could solve anything when we have this discussion about AI, it's this concept of how do we deal with data in a meaningful way. We've talked about de-identification and privacy preserving. So the anxiety about sharing emanates from the fear of what if it's exposed and how do we ensure that it's not re-identified. So some of the challenges always start with Let's assume I have great data and now I've got an algorithm and I can do something. Also a great challenge for us is to think about the pri privacy preservation and the protection against re-identification. And I guess the third thing is uh, Chorchuan and Robert and many people, I'm sure many of you, are working hard to try and share data, tackle these challenges because one inevitability is we're all getting older, we all need more from the system and I think one of the things that I know is your ambition as well for Singapore is let's focus also on stay well as opposed to get well and so how do we think of these things and AI will play a critical role for us. We're believers as SG Innovate we're very very committed to the idea that entrepreneurial adventures 
in artificial intelligence with applications in health are not only exciting but critical as we think about some of these challenges. So thank you for being a part of this. What I will say is if you're interested in being a mentor, an advisor, a co-founder, an investor, we've got lots of great people that we'd love to introduce you to. So part of the goal for this is just to bring more talent together so that we can keep building the ecosystem in order to create great companies from Singapore. So thank you very much.